It's not just related to only salvation. It's related to salvation and transformation of culture, transformation of society, and great revival. Let's read on. There were about 12 men in all. Now, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. What's he doing? He's teaching about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God sermon, the kingdom of God message is greater than salvation. We have a tendency in the West to reduce the gospel to the gospel of forgiveness of sin. The Protestant understanding of the gospel really was, and the, the Protestant understanding of the Holy Spirit's role is related entirely, almost entirely, I'd say entirely, to his role in salvation. Conviction of our sin, drawing us, coming into us, regenerating us, filling us, it's about this role related to salvation. But the New Testament's gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit's role doesn't stop at our personal salvation. The Holy Spirit is involved in the church. The Holy Spirit is leading the church. The Holy Spirit is giving gifts to the church. The Holy Spirit is healing. The Holy Spirit is the means of all of, of the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the way Jesus makes himself known to us today. It's not just related to only salvation. It's related to salvation and transformation of culture, transformation of society, and great revival. Even, even the Puritans believed that the, the kingdom of God was going to be advancing, as I mentioned this the other night, and it would be consummated at the end in a time of great revival when Jesus was going to come back. And the way God was going to advance this was mainly two ways, through revivals and through missions. Now, we know that for them, they also believe that revivals was related to prayer. And it is. You say, well, I don't think Toronto was. Well, you don't know that John and Carol or not had been praying for, from 9 o'clock in the morning or earlier than that, actually, till noon for six months for God, the presence, the power, his visitation. They had been crying out every day for six months before the revival broke out that I had and others had been seeking God in different ways. But the point I wanted to make was the teaching about the kingdom of God. And Jack Taylor's got a new book coming out really soon. I think it's going to be in February, if I'm not mistaken, called Cosmic, last part of the title, Cosmic Initiative. Initiatives on the kingdom of God. He studied it for years. You need to get it. It's going to be a great book. Read about the kingdom of God. Understand the gospel of the kingdom includes deliverance, includes healing, includes the gifts, includes divine enablement as well as the Holy Spirit's role in our salvation. So the gospel of the kingdom is a bigger gospel. Is the, I'm not cutting down the gospel of forgiveness. I'm saying it's that plus this. Revival, if it only focuses on salvation, you can end up with what the Argentine, Argentine is noted for revival after 1954 when Tommy Hicks was used of God to, to break open that country to, uh, to the gospel in a new way. They had series of revival. But one of the disappointing things is some of my friends were key leaders in Argentina, uh, particularly uh, Omar Cabrera and Omar Cabrera Jr. and some leaders in, in the Baptist denomination I've worked with. And one of the things that they, they discovered was when they only focused on building the church, when they only focused on getting people saved and seeing the, the church grow, it was not enough because it wasn't transforming culture. And because it didn't transform culture, it didn't deal with justice, it didn't deal with the right kinds of foundation, the nation had a huge collapse to where you couldn't get your money out of the bank, only a little bit each week. I mean, no matter how much money you had in the bank, you couldn't touch it. It was your money, but you, they only let you have a little bit. It was a huge economic crisis. And they realized that even though that we were seeing the church grow, the church was not having an impact on society. And uh, the millennial generation is not satisfied with a gospel that just deals with heaven. 
The millennial generation is a gospel that deals with justice, a, a gospel that deals with transformational change, a gospel that deals with, with, with uh, actually alleviating some of the hell of this life. And, we're, and, and, and so what the Argentines learn, our younger people are already predisposed to that. We need a bigger gospel that captures the hearts and the minds of a younger generation that can hear the cries of God's people and can see their affliction and understand that God comes down and then he picks us to use us to set the people free. This gospel of the kingdom is a bigger gospel, a more worthy gospel, and it's the kind of gospel that captures the heart of millennials much more than it did us baby boomers. And we were pretty much wanting to see revolution too. Transformation, the gospel of the kingdom is what's got to be taught. Verse 9, but some of them became obstinate and refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. By the way, Christianity was first called the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. This is amazing. All the Jews and all the Greeks who live in the province of Asia, modern Turkey makes up that province today. Everybody heard the word of the Lord. I mean, something is going on there. There is a massive spread of the gospel. They don't have any means of communication like we do today. They, they don't have television, radio, mass print. But everybody heard. God was doing something. There was a great multiplication. There was lots of people sharing. The word made them bold. The Holy Spirit made them bold. And they were proclaiming the word of God with boldness. And Paul was arguing daily for two months there about the kingdom it's not just preaching, it's also teaching. Some of us think that when God comes, we don't need to have any teaching. But I believe that Paul understood differently. He argued and spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom. Power. Let's look at verse 11. Now, you know there's a difference between a miracle and a healing, don't you? It takes, a, it, it, it takes more faith to see a miracle than it does a healing. I have almost never seen a miracle in my life take place that God didn't provide a gift of faith for that miracle. I've seen healings where... It was by our measure of faith that every time I saw a miracle, it was God providing a gift of faith. So miracles are greater than healings. So what do you, you know, what does a miracle look like? Well, I don't know, but let me ask you this. What does an extraordinary miracle look like? Now you got healings, you got miracles, but Paul's, Luke tells about Paul's experience, extraordinary miracles. Through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. So just clothing taken by believers, taken to other people. I see this all over the world. People come, they bring pictures, you pray for the pictures, they, take, they bring people, to, you know, pray for the, uh, you know, sweatbands. It's actually cloth, sweatbands, handkerchiefs that are taken. They'll bring things in and sometimes big packs of them, you pray for them. And I know it's all based on this scripture and it's, and it's, and it's based in faith. I actually had a woman whose daughter got raised from the dead because she brought her picture to me. I didn't know the baby was dead. I didn't, you know, I, I just want to say something. I don't take any credit for that miracle because to be honest with you, um, up to that, after I heard this, before I heard about this story, I really didn't like praying for pictures. I just did it in Brazil because it's a big thing in Brazil. I thought, well, I don't have faith for that, but maybe they do. And so it's, it's easier to pray for it than it is to argue about why you don't want to. It's just quicker. And, but I'm saying this, it wasn't like I'm this great person of faith, I had a lot of faith. But the mother did. And she brought the picture. I didn't know the baby was dead. And I'm just trying to appease her. I'm, it's not like I'm praying to faith. She's got the faith. 
But after I heard about the baby being raised from the dead, I, bring your pictures. <laughs> it, it, it just kind of moved. It kind of moved by. It, you know, I don't feel the same way about it anymore. I say, yeah, I know where. Yeah, I, okay, let's pray about this together. <laughs> you know, I want to say this one time. I, 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 I'm saying this because I have some friends here. I want them to hear this. And I also want you to hear it. I was in Australia. Bill and I were doing a meeting in Australia at a big uh, uh, church. It used to be a vineyard church. And, and, uh, and uh, it's a couple of thousand people. And we were doing a school. It was one of my schools. Bill was one of the speakers. I know I'm getting ready to do a, a, a message uh, on communion. The next thing I'm going to teach on is communion. Uh, and so I come in and people brought me uh, handkerchiefs. And I start praying for them. And I, and I would lay, lay it down. And then they brought me belts. They brought me, you know, uh, Kleenex. They brought me, you know, just, just pieces of wallets. Just, they brought stuff. And I, I'm praying for it. And it literally, no joke, it formed a pile this high that would be from here all the way over to here. Thousands of people coming. And they're, I'm praying for it. Now, I know it's all based on this scripture. But I also know I'm getting ready to teach on communion. And then all of a sudden as I'm doing this, this never happened to me before or since, the Lord speaks to me and said, I've just set you up. <laughs> and I thought, Lord, what do you mean you just set me up? I said, he said, you're getting ready to preach on communion, aren't you? He said, yes. I've just set you up. I said, Lord, I don't. I don't get it. He said, if the people can believe your prayer can cause these cloths to be consecrated and become impenetrated with the presence of God and carry the power and presence of God, then you can help your Pentecostal friends believe that when people pray a prayer of consecration over the Lord's Supper that the elements can become full of the presence and power of God and and they they can become more than an ordinance they can become something we're doing just because we're ordered to do so in remembrance they can carry grace. And the word sacrament is actually, the, the Methodists sometimes use and others a better word. You receive a prophet in the name of a prophet. You receive a... You receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man. You receive a... If you receive a cracker in the name of a cracker. <laughs> or if you receive Christ, receive the reward of Christ. If you receive his presence, 